All right, good afternoon. Welcome back. <laughs> grab a grab a seat. <clears throat> so we're uh, we're going to continue on with uh, with mass moment of inertia, and then I'll get back to examples related to um, rigid body two D kinetics. And we're actually going to solve a problem related to motion, and we're going to calculate angular accelerations and everything. Um, but just so, just so we're clear on the last thing that I did last class, leading into the next few side topics on mass moments of inertia, this is what we did. We did integrals. I showed you the original formula for an integral and how to calculate mass moments of inertia for a disk. And we got that the IG, the mass moment of inertia, is equal to 1 half mr squared. And then I showed you what, it ha what, uh, what happens if you do mass moment of inertia for a thin, heavy ring, where all of the mass is actually hollowed out of the center and pushed towards this one really thin um, part of the ring that is at a radius of capital R away from the center of the ring. And we knew that after our integral, we calculated IG, and this was just simply mr squared. And my argument was that because all the mass had moved out away from the center to this outer ring, basically it has a higher mass moment of inertia that helps to resist angular acceleration. It makes it harder to twist the ring than it does to twist the disk, right? So I bring up these two examples again because I want to introduce a new concept for you guys. And the concept is called the radius of gyration. And it's represented by the letter k. And it's a radius, so it has units of meters, just like you would expect. And here's how we define the radius of gyration. I could have any irregularly shaped object. It doesn't matter. Center of gravity is at g. And the radius of gyration just happens to be the one radius where if you had taken this, the, uh, the integral and you calculated the actual ig for this particular weird body, basically it was as if you had the exact same mass moment of inertia of a ring with the radius at k. Okay, so I'll repeat that. It is as if, so, so here's, your, here's your regularly shaped object. It's filled, solid, okay? It would be the same as if I had a ring, so it's equal to a ring with center of mass g, and where that ring happened to have a radius equal to k. Okay? So why do we, why do we, why do, we do this? Why is it important to have this radius of gyration mk squared? Because it helps with our calculations. It's like basically I could show you any object I can make it really complicated. I could have, for instance, we'll be doing wheels, where the wheels have an internal hub. Maybe it also has an external ridge on it. right? So it's got multiple features associated with it. And it would be very difficult for you to integrate every single point of this object. All we would do is we would give you radius of gyration k for the object. And as soon as you know k, you could calculate the ig as equal to mk squared. Okay? And the logic behind that is just think of it as taking this object, finding an equivalent ring where all of that material got pushed out to that thin, thin ring. That's the, that's the physical meaning behind that. Okay? Is everyone clear on that? So if this is the case, that I can convert any irregularly shaped object, make it ig is equal to mk squared, that means I could actually do the same thing for the disk. The disk is not a ring, and I could actually find the radius of gyration for a disk. So let me do that. If I did, if I did what is the k for the disk on the far board, what would the k value be for that disk? So the idea would be the following. You would take the known ig of the disk, which is 1 half m r squared, and you would just simply equate it to mk squared. And if you did that, the m's would cancel, 
And k would simply be r over the square root of 2. Right? And r over the square root of 2, that's roughly 0.707r, roughly speaking. So what, is that, what does that tell you? That tells me that the way that this disk is behaving, with some of the mass close to the center, some of the mass far away, it's behaving as if it was a ring, but a ring that was roughly right there, like 70% of the way to the actual outer edge of that disk. Right? So somewhere in here, this is my k. And that's the right balance between material that was really, really far away and material that was really, really close to the center. OK? Does that, does that make sense? So from now on, whenever there's a complicated object and we don't have the IG available in, in, a, in a form that's nice and neat, then I'll just simply give you the k value, and then you can calculate IG as mk squared. OK? So that was the first little concept associated with mass moment of inertia. We did integrals. Now we've done radius of gyration. And so I want to introduce another. I've got two more of these little tricks for calculating things, calculating the IGs of objects. So I'll give you the second one. The second one is actually um, just a matter of this, uh, the example I did where the slender rod was moved, remember, from the center to the very tip of the slender rod? There's actually a, a really easy way to do that instead of doing integrals again. And so I want to introduce the idea of this parallel axis theorem, which I will abbreviate as PAT. OK, so here, here's the idea. I'm going to give your, I'm going to give um, your typical irregularly shaped rigid body center of mass g, and I'm going to locate my x and y axes on that center of mass. But remember the mass moment of inertia, the subscript matters. It's the point in which you want to measure the mass moment of inertia. So if it's ig, it's mass moment of inertia about center of mass. But if it's ia, some other location, you have to get the moment of inertia from that point. So let's say my point A happens to be way out here, far away from my center of mass G. And let's assume that this distance is distance D. Okay, So point A is distance D along the x-axis. Now if I carried out my integral to find my I A, Here's what I would be doing. Here's my little mass inside of my rigid body, dm. I would note that the integral, note that my mass moment inertia ia is equal to integral of the entire mass times r squared dm. And the r is measured from position A, right? So this is, if I am rotating about A, I want my r to be this particular, this particular distance from A to dm. But with respect to g, if I wanted to know how it, was, how it was rotating or what mass moment of inertia it had around g, right? I could do a comparison with this particular distance from g to that point and call that r prime. Okay, and where is R prime located? R prime is actually located. Let's just move this arrow here. R prime is really located with respect to the origin. So this is just your x prime and y prime above the x-axis, right? So we've got an R prime value. R prime is measured from g, and then the R value is the extended length where it's far away and it's at point A. Okay. So if I wanted to measure mass moment of inertia of IA, here's what it would look like if I expanded my R using Pythagorean theorem. It would look like this. IA is equal to the integral. And so my R 
is really just this whole length down here, the d plus the x prime, all squared. So d plus x prime, all squared, plus my y prime squared. And you take that whole thing, and that's, that's your actual r squared, right? dm. And now I'm going to expand it out. So this would be a d squared 2dx prime plus an x prime squared plus a y prime squared, like that. Okay, this is a prime. Okay, and so here's what we'll notice. We'll notice actually that this x prime, y prime, these two terms squared, is actually equivalent to just the distance from g to that point. So this is just r prime squared. Okay. And then I'll also note that if you look at this term here, 2d, sorry, 2dx, right? 2dx prime. 2dx prime happens to be equal to 0. And the reason is because of how we define the center of mass. You'll remember that um, the rod with the balancing of the, of the rigid body and how it balances on both sides. Basically, what's happening is you integrate anything with an x prime, like so, and that has to be just equal to 0, right? So there's, there's, there's bits that are to the right of g and bits to the left of g, and if you balance it out, add them all together, it'll always be 0. So this term after expansion 0, this is your r, square, uh, r prime squared. So what do we have as a final equation for IA? What you get is IA is integral of r prime squared plus d squared dm integral of, and I'm going to break up these two. I'm going to break up these two integrals now. And this integral is now just your ig. And the d squared, that's a constant distance for the way that I've drawn it in the diagram. So this is just your m. Integral of all the little dms makes the final m, the mass, m d squared. OK? So the parallel axis theorem from this derivation is telling you something really, really useful. It's saying, as long as you know ig, and you know how far away you are from the point you actually are rotating around, then ia is just simply the ig plus this m d squared term. And you can, again, avoid the need to do any integrals. OK? So I'll give, you, I'll give you the best demonstration of this here, which is back to the slender rod. Right? You'll remember the slender rod? Slender rod around g. ig was equal to 1 12th ml squared, right? OK? So now picture this. If I wanted to move it to the end of the rod, so here's g. So end of the rod in this case, that's my point a. The distance between a and g is my, my little d, which is l over 2. So it would be the equivalent to saying, I want this ia around the new point is equal to ig plus md squared. Is I is sorry one twelfth m l squared plus m times l over two squared, right? Because the d is just my l over two, and then you add this up, and it becomes one twelfth plus one quarter m l squared one third m l squared. And so using the parallel axis theorem, it actually gives me the exact same answer as the IA I calculated last class, where I integrated from 0 to L to get 1 third ML squared. OK?
Okay, so imagine, imagine now I can, I can say, you know, let's do the disk again, but instead of IG, let's rotate the disk around. Perhaps it's rolling without slip on a surface, and I want you to figure out I at the bottom, the instantaneous center. And so what you would do, you do parallel axis theorem, and you say, I know what it is. It's IG plus MD squared, right? How far I'm moving the G point to another location. Okay, so that's parallel axis theorem and an example to go with it. And then I'll give you one, so that was two tricks. I'll give you one third trick here. The third trick is you can add or subtract known shapes to get to a final shape for, or a final IG for, for a more complicated shape. So let me say if we had a donut, for instance, right? And the donut shape was, you know, a disk. But instead of a ring, it was like just a little bit of the, the center was cored out. So you can't really use the integral method that I and you, you can't use the simplification that I showed you last class where it became just a thin ring, mr squared. So in fact, you can do an integral here. The integral in this case would be you would integrate from ri all the way to ro, right? Et cetera, right? So you could do the integral. Integral method, no problem. Okay, but easier method is big disk minus the little disk. So the IG of a donut is essentially the IG of the big disk minus IG of the small disk. Right? And so IG donut is as easy as this, 1 half m ro squared minus 1 half m ri squared, and that's it. That's your answer, right? So we can easily add and subtract objects as necessary. Now, I picked an, an, a really easy example here. Imagine if I did disk maybe with a square cutout. Right. Right. If I did that, you definitely don't, wouldn't want to integrate, right? Really, really bad idea to use the integral method, right? But amazingly easy if you just did add and subtract. You look it up in a table, you do a one half mr squared, and then you subtract the mass moment of inertia of a square, and then you're done. Okay? Okay, so kind of got the feel for it. I'll do one more example before I do, before I go to like the equation of motion stuff. Let's see here. So let me do a mass moment of inertia of a T shape. All right, so here you go. I'm going to do a T-shape example. I'll show you this is my point A that I'm interested in. And, and the T-shape is actually a uh, just a real basic joining of two slender rods. So let's just think of it as two slender rods, and they're welded together at this joint. OK? 
Okay. Mass of, let me see how I did this here. So mass, so weight is 50 newtons each rod. And what do I have here? L is one meter. Okay, and so the questions are as follows. Find center of mass G of the whole rod, of the whole T-shape, sorry. And then find IG of the T-shape and IA of the T-shape. Okay? All right, so this is going to be the beginning of pretty much every rigid body problem that you do. You look at the rigid body, you've got to figure out all your IGs and IAs and everything else. Okay, so the first things first, let's find G. G of this whole object is no longer just the G of the slender rod because this thing is welded to it, so it's going to push the G value probably likely further down compared to uh, where it normally would be for the vertical rod. So how do we find G? So finding G, let's measure from point A. Okay, so we can do this a number of ways, but if I, if I took this as my, sort of my Y is equal to zero point and I went downward, that's just the reference point that I decided to choose. So how, do we, how would we do this? It would be basically your definition of how to find MR. Remember that the mass total of the entire T-bar is going to be multiplied by its RG value. And this is equivalent to summing I's of all the MI's RI's. Okay? So that was the original definition for how to find center of mass. So that means that if I rearrange, you would get RG and then the two slender rods adding up together with the different Rs. So it would be 50 Newton weight divided by 9.81. So that's the mass of a single slender rod. And then measured from point A, the vertical rod has a distance of 0.5 meters from point A. Right? So that would be the vertical one. Vertical. And then I would add this to 50 over 9.81 multiplied by, well, the whole the horizontal rod is like a complete one meter distance away from point A. So that would give me that. And then I would divide. So this is now my horizontal slender rod. And so I take this and I would divide it by the entire mass, which would be. 100 divided by 9.81. So RG is 0 0.75 meters, okay, as measured from A. So here's our, here's our one, milli, one meter length, and this was the original halfway point for one slender rod. I'm actually right here. This is the official G for the entire T-bar, and that is at 0 0.75 meters, right? Okay? So once I know that point, I can now go ahead and try to find my IG and my IA. Okay, so IGs, IAs, right? Okay, now there's, number of, there's a number of ways to do this. I can tell you actually the easier thing to do is to figure out IA first. Right? And I'll tell you why in a second. It has to do with the fact that the G is sort of buried in that 0.75 distance. Not really convenient. Let me do IA first. So IA is the following. Basically, the whole T-bar 
is going to be the sum, just like my adding and subtracting shapes. Total IA for the T-bar must be the I of the vertical rod plus I of the horizontal rod. All right. Now the I of the vertical rod is same as if I took the whole rod and I was swinging it at the end. So that must be 1 third ML squared, where M is the mass of a single rod. OK, so it's 1 third ML squared. That's the vertical one. What's the horizontal one? So the horizontal one is like this. You take this horizontal one, start it at the original point A. If I move this up to point A and drew a dotted line around it, it's actually the same as a slender rod rotating about the middle point of the rod. Okay? But I'm taking the slender rod like that, and I'm shifting it, and I need to use the parallel axis theorem. Okay? So for the horizontal rod, the idea is 1 12th ml squared, the slender rod for the midway point, and then plus the distance moved using parallel axis theorem, so a complete m capital L squared. Okay, now if I did the fractions right, then this will be 4 over 12, 1 over 12, 12 over 12. So this would be 17 over 12 ml squared, where m is the mass of a single rod of one rod. Okay, and then I believe I gave you numbers, so um, the official solution is, I believe, 7.22 7 kilograms meters squared. Okay, so that's IA. So why did I do IA first, then IG? Because, like I said, this was really, really easy to calculate, but now that I need IG, I can do parallel axis theorem again. It's like if I took my parallel axis theorem equation and I simply rearranged it, it would be IG is IA minus MD squared. Right? So now I actually have my IA. My IA is the 17 over 12 ML squared. Right? But now I can shift it. How far should I shift it back? Well, the RG was 0.75 meters. So all I need to do is I need to subtract my M, right? And by the way, so my M now, so this is the, the, the total where the M is mass of a single rod. This MD squared now, this M must be you're shifting the entire T bar. So this will be 109.81, that's the mass. And then d squared is my 0.75 meters, all squared. So ig is equal to 1.486 kilograms meters squared. OK, any questions on that? Yeah, but remember how I did two parallel axis theorem uses in this problem, right? So in the first case, where I was just focusing on vertical and horizontal slender rods, you can tell that I was only shifting the horizontal rod, right? But in this case, how were we applying parallel axis theorem? I was, in fact, looking at the IA as my complete T-bar. And I'm looking for the IG of the complete T-bar. So if this is the complete, if this is looking for the mass moment of inertia of the complete rigid body, then yes, this M is the complete mass of the body, and this D is also how far you move the G of the body to the other point. Would it also be the same thing if you broke up M squared for I horizontal, or M D squared vertical and M D squared horizontal? M D squared horizontal. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, that, that would work, but your D, you have to be sure, I mean, the D is supposed to be the 0.75 for both the vertical and the horizontal, but you're just now making it more complicated for yourself, I think. So um, I think this is your better way, OK? And I think one, one, really, one really good um, sanity check here is notice your IG. Your IG should be the, the smallest of all the I's, right? No, no mass moment of inertia is smaller than your IG. And so you make sure that when you do your calculations, if you've moved to a point outer, outside of your G, that's not your G, that has to be bigger. Why? Because of the parallaxis theorem, right? IG is like you've moved everything as close as possible, and you're spinning it just around the center of mass. IA is like if you move masses even further away from center of mass. So this has to be bigger. OK? All right, so I'm going to do one last example here. And so we're finally done with the mass moment inertia stuff. I'm going to expect you guys to know all of that. And now is the time when we start actually applying it to rigid body motion problems. Okay, so this is now example number one for kinetics of rigid bodies. So I'm going to put Okay, so I'm going to have a setup like this where I have a pivot point at point O of a long rod. We're going to neglect the mass of the rod. Okay, and I'm only going to be worried about the two big spheres at the end of the rods, M1 and M2. So this, this particular mass, the M1, is actually one meter to the left of the pivot point. Mass 2 is 4 meters to the right of the pivot point. Uh, we're going to ignore gravity. So how do we ignore gravity? Assume actually that this is like um, the ground, like the horizontal plane, and we're looking at the top-down view, essentially. So this, this system is going to start rotating. Let's assume that it's actually rotating. Let's assume that it's rotating like this, OK? So we're not worried about gravity on the vertical direction of the board. But what I am going to do is I'm going to apply this force right on mass 2. And I'm going to call that F applied. And F applied is going to be 10 newtons. OK? So here I'll give you the, the rest of the data on this problem. M1 is 3 kilograms. M2 is 2 kilograms, and F applied, like I said, is 10 newtons. And the whole thing starts from rest, so omega naught is 0. And then we're going to be asked, what is alpha initially? What is angular acceleration? OK? So that's it. You, you, that's, it's as simple as it gets. We're just pushing with a force F app. And we want to know what is the initial angular acceleration. OK. OK, so let's go back to lectures. The general approach to solving rigid body problems, it's actually the set of three equations where we deal with Newton's second law. So we definitely need to go back to an fx max. We definitely need to use an fy may. And we definitely need to use now our moments. And I'm guessing we should do moments. Let's do moments about g for now. So it's mg is equal to ig alpha. 
Okay. Okay, and what we need is we need to establish a free body diagram. So we're ignoring gravity, but definitely the free body diagram should be the F applied on this mass. And we should expect some forces acting at the pivot point. We'll call that a reaction force. Uh, which symbol did I use? I actually just used Fy and Fx. Okay? So I'm calling the Fx, Fy as the reaction forces on the pivot point, and I've assigned it directions not knowing what their values are. Okay? Okay, so if you look at this, I'm going to start with the x direction equation. And so the sum of all the forces external to the system would be the reaction force plus my F app. And that would be equal to MAX. Oops, sorry. It's not it's FX, just FX. Okay, so there's only one force acting in the x direction, and then we're going to have an m of the whole system, ax. But this is a, and, and how do we write this ax? Remember, it is ag, right? It is the acceleration of the center of mass of the whole system. Okay? So where is, where is g? We haven't even figured out where g is, right? So we have o, but where, where is our g? So let's figure out our g. I'm going to start here. Like, we would do the same thing that we normally would do. Rg is the sum of miris divided by m total. Right? And I'm doing that because, again, this is like two separate discrete masses. It's, not, um, it's just two balls that are far away from each other. So I'm going to do the following. It'll be m1, m1 being one meter away. So this is three kilograms, one meter away. And then I'm going to add that to the two kilogram mass, but that's four meters away. And I'm going to divide it by the total, which is five kilograms. So RG is going to be one meter to the right of O. So G is actually right here, this point. OK? And so what we're interested in is if this G point is going to, if this whole thing is going to spin about O, I'm interested in knowing the accelerations of G. So what are the accelerations of G? Well, if this thing is pinned at O, we expect G to be moving in a circular path. And guess what? If we know the path of G is circular, we know that this is the tangential direction. So this would be AG tangential. And then this would be our AG normal, right? Just like the things that we did for the wheel. Now, look at this and tell me, if AG normal is pointing into the rod, that is our x direction. That is actually equivalent to our AGX, right? But what is the magnitude of AG, normal direction? It is omega squared r. And omega, initially, is 0. OK? So you could, you could write that. You can write this as the following. It will be essentially an m times an AGN, right, with a negative sign. So it should be like m omega squared naught times r, right, which is the distance of r, g with respect to o with a negative sign. But none of it matters. Omega naught is 0. Right? OK, so that's useful. Now the next thing is your Fy. So Fy is the reaction force plus your F app. And this will now be equal to mass, so just looking at this diagram here, F applied, Fy. And now it should be your MAGY, 
But AGY is luckily for us the same as the tangential acceleration. So we already know the magnitude of that. We know that it has to be our alpha. So this is our alpha, RG with respect to O, and that's the unknown that we're looking for. OK? So it looks like we still have two unknowns, the FY and the alpha. We need another equation. So we need to pull out our mg is equal to ig alpha. Our alpha shows up again, so the equations are coupled. And now I have to figure out what are all my moments and what is my ig. Okay, so I'll give you ig. Ig is, what's Ig going to be? It's going to be our, our either the integral form or the sum of all of my mr ri squareds, right? It's like how far are the masses away from my g um, because it's a system of particles. So Ig must therefore be, it's going to be the uh, 3 kilogram mass that happens to be 2 meters to the left. Right? So negative 2 if you want, but the square doesn't, doesn't matter. 2 kilograms times 3 meters squared. And so Ig is going to be equal to 30 kilogram meters squared. OK? And then when it comes to the moments, right? If we're going to do the moments, Let's say I do sum of all the moments about g. What should that look like? So here's my point, and I've got two forces, my f app and my f y. The f app is going to be in the positive counterclockwise direction. So it's really an f app that is multiplied by the moment arm of 3 meters away from g. And then it's going to be minus f y, 1 meter. Right? So those are my mg's, and then it's going to be equal to i g alpha. OK, so that's it. We've got two equations, two unknowns in f, y, and alpha, and you solve them. Alpha and f, y. And so I'll just show you quickly the substitution of one of them into the other. It's basically this one here. It'll be 10 newtons times 3 meters minus 3 minus Fy times 1 Ig. And I'm going to take this equation here. And I'm going to rearrange it so that we have an Fy. Oops. Fy plus 10 is equal to 5 kilograms times 1 meter times alpha. So Fy is. Five alpha minus ten. Okay, so I can take this five alpha minus ten and drop it in here. Okay, and so I'll give it to you. It'll be alpha is equal to one point one four radians per second squared if you solve it like that. Okay, and that's your final. That's your final answer. Question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, question is, can we do moments about 0.0? You bet. And in fact, I can probably finish the problem in the rest of this board with just 0.0 as my location. So, how do you do it? If you do MO, what's the, what's the great thing about this? The sum of all the moments about O ignores all the reaction forces at the pivot. So really, this is the same as if I did F app 
times the, however far it is away from O. So in this case, it would be 4 meters. And this is going to be equal to IO times alpha. We just have to figure out what IO is. So what do you think IO is? Well, IO is, by parallel axis theorem, IG plus MD squared. So what is that? It's going to be my 30 that I previously calculated. I'm going to add that to the total sum mass of the system of particles, 5 kilograms. And d squared, I've just shifted it by 1 meter. Okay, So my new IO is just 35 kilograms meter squared. So I'm going to plug that in there. Alpha would be equal to F app times 4 meters divided by my new IO. And it gives you the exact same answer in basically three lines. OK? So bingo. So there you have it. It's, a, it's an example of like, yes, you can do. And so I want to I re, I want to summarize that a little bit, right? Um, the question there was, can we use O? And the answer is yes. I've given you two ways to calculate your moments in this system of equations. The fx, fy equations definitely apply that to the center of mass. That has to be at g. But when it comes to the moment, you have a choice. If you have a fixed point of rotation, you can use point O. Right? Or you can also use G. Both of them give you the same answer. Question over there. I don't use FY when I'm summing the moments? Because yeah. uh, FY is going through O. Right? FY, FX, FY are through O, and the moment arm would be 0. Right? So that's, that's an advantage of picking the fixed point of rotation, is if there are any reaction forces, they're, they're there in the sum of x and sum of fy equations, but they disappear for the moment equation because they don't cause a moment. Okay. All right, any other questions? All good? All right, and I'm guessing you guys are wondering, so tomorrow, right, midterm, 6 PM to 8 PM everything up until the end of chapter 16, right? So everything to do with particles, that's kinematics, and the F is equal to MA, and the work and energy, and the momentum and impulse. And then for the rigid body stuff, though, only chapter 16 kinematics, OK? So expect to be asked accelerations and velocities and stuff, but none of this. No mass moment of inertia, OK? See you guys tomorrow, 6 p.m.